Hi, I'm Megan. I'm Colin. And we are the hosts of Pet, pet Sitter, Sitter Confessional, Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Thank you very much to Pet Sitters Associates and our wonderful Patreon members for supporting today's show. If you don't know what a Patreon member is, they contribute a few dollars of their hard-earned dog walking and pet sitting money every month to keep the show going. We now have over 400 episodes and hopefully 400 more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have found value in the show, you can learn what it means to be a Patreon at PetSitterConfessional.com slash support. We know a lot of people listen on all sorts of platforms across the internet, uh, on our website, on your favorite podcasting app, or or on YouTube even. However, one of these platforms is going away. If you are a dyed-in-the-wool Stitcher fanatic, it will be no more very, very soon. Actually, they're completely getting rid of that app. It's been around for a really long time, but they're shutting the doors because it's not profitable for them anymore. So if you are, again, if you listen to Stitcher, if you are listening to us on Stitcher right now, go download a different podcast app. Well, and I think they're going to be shunting everybody over to Pandora. So if you listen on Pandora or if you have Pandora, you can also listen there. I know Apple Podcasts and Spotify are the two biggest players but there's a bunch of other ones out there as well. If you're on Android, you can also obviously listen on Google Podcast. I recommend Podcast Addict. And if you are an iOS listener, uh, you can switch over to Overcast, which is my personal favorite. We are also looking forward to our rescheduled first Friday meetup this Friday, the 21st at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time for our Great Dane members of the Patreon group. We are excited to talk to everyone then. One of the questions that we have on our employee application is tell us about a stressful situation in your life and how you handled it. That's a question, again, from our interview process and one that gets a lot of very interesting comments back to it. Most people say something like, oh, I just kind of got busy and worked through it or it was really bad for a while and I didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, particularly as business owners, we are going to have stress in this business. What? We take care of living beings. That that's that's a stress in and of itself. They are these are family members. These are very important to the client. So there's there's this added stress of that and then all the admin and everything that goes along with running a business. Sometimes it's acute stress that we have just for a very short time and sometimes it's chronic stress if we have bad habits or little boundaries in our business. These things can creep up and just cause our shoulders to just droop a little bit more and more. Every Every day because of that stress, the stress of, of running your business every day. Then there's the events that happen that take it to a whole nother level. And those are the ones that we want to talk about today. How do you handle these stressful situations? Well, your body has your body has three ways. It's fight, flight, or freeze. You're either running away, running towards, or your body is standing still. Well, and a lot of times we've heard about that in school. We learned about the, the body and how it adapts to stressful environments, situations through these different mechanisms. Yeah, it's purely f- survival mode. Your, your your brain switches to lizard brain and it goes, keep me alive. That's all it's thinking about at this point is how do I survive? It's at this point where animals typically will defecate, they urinate, their heart rate goes through the roof, their respiratory rate increases, their body temperature actually increases well, all the muscles are tensed and ready to go. But here's the thing, each have a place And when we're talking about emergency, there's a need for each one of these. I think too often people glorify the fight response as being the one true way of like, if you're not fighting, you're not winning and you got to fight, 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 fight. But honestly, if someone's in the house running at me, I'm running away. Right? I am not standing there to, 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 to fight that person off. I need to flee. Now, the, the one you wouldn't want to do is freeze in that situation. But sometimes freezing is beneficial if it allows you to take in more information about the situation before you make a judgment call and know what to do. Encountering a stressful situation while performing pet sitting and dog walking visits is unfortunately very likely to happen. Everything from being locked out of a house and not being able to find a cat to a medical emergency or even a lost animal. And while it's never possible to fully prepare or or be in the mindset for every possible situation, there are actually several things that you can do in the moment to stay calm and under control. Often where I go when I get panicked is the adrenaline. I feel my my blood pressure and my body surge up and I'm kind of jacked. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I run on that adrenaline. But at the same time, we still need to function and respond appropriately. I still need to be able to form sentences and coherently address the issue at hand, whether it's through talking with somebody else or just figuring out and problem solving the next thing that needs to happen. 
Well, and that's exactly what this whole process is. Of we, I just said that the fight, flight, or freeze is part of our lizard brain to preserve our bodies. We go pure instinctual, pure lizard brain to keep ourselves alive. We have a lot of higher functioning things that we have to take care of in this situation. When we ask, how do you handle a, situ- a stressful situation? We're saying, how do you exert control or your intent onto the situation to either resolve it, make it better, or get out of there? That takes higher level brain functionality and the adrenaline, the blood pumping, the increased respiratory rate, all of that clouds and obscures our ability to do that. So we have to, in the moment, be able to go, okay, I feel this. I see this. What do I do now? What's the, what's my next step? And the, the biggest thing for me is taking a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a few, depending on how bad the situation is. Right. You know, that deep and controlled breathing from your belly, not just from your chest of the, <sighs> like that's a fast, but it's just like it's very deep from your gut. It can have an immediate calming effect on your body and mind. I learned a lot about this when I was pregnant with, with our kids of breathing is very important and to do it from your entire body, not just your upper portion of your chest and to exhale slowly and, and deeply as well, because that is, is a, a release for your mind of those chemicals and, and that those feelings of just, okay, I'm letting this go. You know, a lot of people count to five. I think I saw that in a movie one time of they counted to five and then they addressed the situation or they sat in their feelings for five seconds and then they moved on. And again, what we're doing here is this is a psychological, physiological, and physical exertion of control over your body. Making the deep breathing whenever you get excited, that drill in your, your body is going, <laughs> and we have to go, <gasps> This is changing our physiology of how our body's functioning. It's exerting a physical control, and it's helping our mind slow down. I'm, and sure, just, I'm sure people loved that sound. I'm so sorry, people. You can just skip over that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what that does. <laughs> the second one is grounding techniques. These help you refocus on the present moment, reducing those feelings of stress and anxiety. It can be something as simple as identifying you know, the, the, using your senses, identifying five things that you see, four things you can touch, three things you hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. I'm glad they didn't do five things you can taste because that would be <laughs> very different. <laughs> but what it's, it's meant to bring you in the moment. And in an emergency, this is extremely important. Five things I see when I see, okay, I see the, the kettle knocked down, down, I see the trash gotten into, I see this chewing over thing. Taste could just be, hmm, I still taste the coffee in my mouth from this morning. It's to make you physically and mentally present and aware of all of your surroundings. And again, your brain is telling you either run away, run towards, or stop moving, stop thinking, and just hold on. But you are exerting control and going, no, I'm going to name five things. I'm going to name four things. And it allows you to be more present in that situation. Well, and to actually document what's going on, too. Yeah. Because in stressful situations, your brain, your, your body may say run, but your mind might say freeze. And so you, you're trying to come to terms with everything that's going on of, okay, I, I come into a situation where the dog is unresponsive. What do I need to do? Okay, well, my body, my body is saying go to the dog, but my mind is saying, ah, it's, it's panicking. It's, it's locking up. I don't know what to do. And so having some of these grounding techniques of, oh, okay, well, I, five things I can see. I can see that the gums of the dog are pale. Okay, I know that that's a concern. It also may be noting the time of when you walked in. So that's another th- important factor of later whenever you have to report this emergency or we have to de- decompress from the stressful situation. Just noting how long the whole thing took may be a critical piece of information as well. Another tactic you can, you can use is the mindfulness and meditation. Again, being present in the moment as much as possible, letting go of any past things that happened or anything in the future of, okay, well, last time I walked in, maybe you've, this is the second time that you've had this situation happen where you've come into a dog unresponsive and you know the last time ended up with the dog dying and, and you bring in those past feelings and you try to catastrophize of this current situation, well, that's going to end up just how it is. It was the last time. And then a future worry may be thinking about the repercussions of the client being angry at you or you may sit there and go, oh my goodness, if somebody else finds out that I walked in on this dog and they're like this, I'm never going to have any other visits and my, my business is going to crash. And we're going to, so you have to save all of that for later. You can observe your thoughts. You can go, that's a worry. That's a concern. That's a fear. Not for right now. 
right, just for a few minutes, I need to focus on the here and now and, and look at the other five senses, the other senses that I'm pulling in. But I'm going to note all these thoughts, focus on the ones that are actually pertinent to helping me get through the situation in this moment, and then process those things later. When you are in a stressful situation, something else that may help is some physical activity. Now, if you are in a true emergency where you need to transport the pet or you've come into some other situation about the home, the home's on fire or something, obviously physical activity would not be the best in this scenario because it is an an emergency. But when you have a little bit of space and time and you are still stressed out about an event, Taking a little jog or taking a walk around a block is helpful. That the physical movement or some stretching, that physical movement is going to help clear your mind and reduce the feelings of stress because your body and mind are focusing on something else other than the activity at hand. Well, and, and in that stressful situation, a lot of times our bodies are required to move. Run to the dog, pick up the dog, run to the car, driving in the car, carrying in the dog, making phone calls, texting, working on all this stuff. You are physically moving. And so th- that is actually as a process of helping you focus on the activities that you're doing. Now, after the fact, sometimes when that activity goes away, you have some trouble coping with it. If it's a less emergency situation where maybe you walk in and the, the a vase has been cracked over and it's spilled on the floor and it's shattered into a billion and a half pieces. That's pretty stressful, especially if you know if it's a very costly uh, or family family heirloom. Or there's a million pieces on the floor that you have to clean up. (laughs) After after you've taken a breath, after you've done your your senses thing, after you've thought about this mindfulness, you may sit there and jog in place or pace in the room a little bit if you start to because at that point you you'll have a mismatch of your body elevates itself with rapid breathing rapid blood pumping all these things muscles tensing if you don't have a release for that it can actually make more stress and strain and a lot more uh, make the stressful, stressful situation even worse for you so have it, giving that a quick outlet and then going and addressing the situation can can be very beneficial another thing that i learned while birthing our humans was <laughs> <laughs> were the the positive affirmations they can be really helpful you know they i can do this my body was made for this i i am tough enough i am strong enough i know my business well enough to do these things it can really boost your confidence and help you manage that stress more effectively because as a business owner you have the obligation of communicating with your clients about what is going on so if your brain cannot properly process and coherently think of sentences and form sentences you are not going to be able to to effectively run your business when you need to as far as communication with your clients. Because let's say you walk in and you find a pet motionless on the floor. Well, you can't communicate effectively if you're an emotional mess. So those above steps that we just talked about are going to help. They're going to help you get in the mindset to now take over control and handle that situation much more effectively. Obviously, again, every single detail of a stressful situation is very unique. We're trying to tackle this at a broad level of how can we prepare mentally and physically for these in the moment? What can we do? And now, as as you said, Megan, communication is usually a very close second to things when in a stressful situation is you have to communicate either to a client, to uh, an employee, to another staff member, to a, an ER vet, to a, a neighbor. You have to talk to somebody about this. So what are some ways to communicate well in a stressful situation or in an emergency? The first one is to maintain composure. It is essential to remain calm to effectively communicate the situation. The only way that we can remain calm is if we have worked through the previous five steps. This is where that big breath comes in. Take one, maybe two, maybe 10, whatever it is. But, but the other part of this step is to, at this stage when we, are, when we are communicating and we are trying to maintain our composure, before you make that phone call, before you go and talk to somebody, you need to expect to be hit by a wave of emotion, especially if you have to communicate to a client a bad situation you know they are going to have a big emotion. You know they're going to be enraged. You know that they are going to be immediately crying and hurt and deeply wounded. So don't get caught off guard when it happens. Expect that response from them so that when you're talking to them on the phone and it happens, you are able to continue to communicate effectively to them through those emotions that they are having. Well, and know that unless it is genuinely your fault, like you left the door wide open and the cat or dog escaped, like unless it is your fault, the emotions that the client has are nine times out of 10 not directly 
directed at you. So try not to take those personally. If if the dog was in distress and needed to be taken to the emergency vet, the client who's probably on the other side of the world or in a different country, they may start crying because this is their family member. However, know that you did nothing wrong. And so the, the crying is not because they are upset with wh- how you acted or what you did. When you are communicating about a situation, clearly state the problem at hand. Be precise about what it is, the, the facts and the knowledge and the observations that you have. For example, you could say, our staff arrived and Baxter was unresponsive in the dining room. That's good, but if you're calling for help or backup for for emergency services, you should start your call with, I'm here at XYZ client and their dog is unresponsive. I need assistance getting him to the car as soon as possible. This is their address. Clearly stating exactly what the problem is and the need that you have, because people are going to have a lot of questions and they're always going to know, know, what's my role? How do I help? What do I need to do? You also need to be concise, especially in emergencies. It's important to convey critical information quickly. Something like, we attempted CPR to no effect and are transporting him to the ER right now. We'll update you once we arrive. If you start by saying something like, well, I noticed he wasn't moving at first and that freaked me out. So I went over to him and tried pushing on him, but nothing happened. So I set my bag down and started to do CPR on him, blah, 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 blah. It's too much wasted information. It's too much do it's a word vomit on that person at that time. And sometimes people turn into talking machines when they're stressed out. It, it just happens to people because our, our brain is racing, our heart's racing, our lungs are racing, and we're just, things are coming out of us. So before you have to communicate anything, and you may have to do this multiple times throughout the entirety of the situation. If somebody reaches out to you for information, or if you have to communicate new information to somebody, take a massive breath. And like you said, Megan, count to five. These five seconds of reflection will save you countless minutes of endless talking and back and forth and will allow you to focus your thoughts in that moment. Because then it's critical to listen. They always say God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? So we're supposed to listen more (laughs) than we talk. Whether it's instructions from management or a client that has concerns, understanding their perspective is essential. If the client says, do whatever you can to save him. You have to listen to their response. They may have a solution on hand. They have emer- they may have emergency medications. They may have an inhaler or a neighbor that is going to be coming over to help you. And then it's very important to repeat the directions of what you are supposed to do back to them. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a client, whether it's an emergency responder, whoever it is, repeat those directions because your brain is going to remember those better than if you are just in a fight or flight mode not really listening and trying to do many tasks at the same time. But if you take a moment, repeat, okay, you said for me to do X, Y, Z. I am going to do X, Y, Z next. Yep, because you're going to be very distracted. There could be a lot of things going on. You are worried. Maybe your mind starts to wander to those future thoughts of the client repercussions coming down on you. And somebody goes, did you understand that? You go, uh, (laughs) what? So that allows you to stay more present in the moment. And remember, the client isn't just a person that you are reporting to and sending data to. They are an active partner in this process as well. Because it's their home. It's their pet. They have agency in how this process should go. So keeping them in the loop every step of the way is going to help them feel more comfortable when they are away. And then as always, show empathy. In stressful situations, especially those involving pets, showing an understanding that you have can help alleviate a lot of stress that others may have and allow you to be be seen as well. Saying something like, I can't believe this is happening either, but rest assured we're doing everything we can. We'll update you in the next 20 minutes. What can make some emergencies a little bit easier to deal with is when you have pet sitters associates. As pet care professionals, your clients trust you to care for their furry family members, and that's why Pet Sitters Associates is here to help. For over 20 years, they have provided thousands of members with quality pet care insurance. Because you work in the pet care industry, you can take your career to the next level with flexible coverage options, client connections, and complete freedom in running your business. Learn why Pet Sitters Associates is the perfect fit for you and get a free quote at petsitllc.com. You can get a discount when joining by clicking Membership Pet Sitter Confessional and using the discount code CONFESSIONAL when you go to check out. Check out the benefits of membership and insurance once again at PetsitLLC.com. Emergency communication is tough. You have to decide your own style. You have to talk to your body and say, okay, what do you do in a stressful situation and how can we overcome this? 
a key part of this is to determine set communication frequencies. Is it going to be every 15 minutes, every 30, every hour, or just when you have new information to give to the client? Depending on the situation, you'll need to lengthen or shorten that frequency, but don't keep a constant line of never-ending back-and-forth messages. It's going to stress you out. It's going to elevate your cortisol levels. It's going to elevate the client as well because they, they, they want to know now what exactly is happening every two minutes. You'll be distracted. The client will be overwhelmed. Nobody will be happy in that situation. So it's good on your part to set the expectations of we will update you. It, it will come. It is going to happen. And is, we will do it in about this frequency. Yep. And it's, and it's, you're going to be checking in regardless of anything new, better or worse is happening. They know to expect however you're going to get in touch with them. And that's the other part of this. What's your communication style? How we communicate? In what method will you communicate? Are you going to communicate over text, over phone, through your software, over email, carrier pigeon? All right. I, Personally, I prefer an initial contact to be made over the phone to alert to them exactly the situation and our plan to handle it. And then we'll inform the owner of both how often to expect updates and what method future communications will come from. Because we are trying to give them as much peace of mind as possible. They need to know, am I going to get a phone call? What does a phone call mean versus a text message? What does a text message mean versus an email? Or should this come through the app? Do they have their alerts, their notifications set to to turn on so that they know what to be looking for? And they may disagree with you. At this stage, they go, no, please call me with each update. You, You need to be okay with then calling them for the updates and not texting them. And then be prepared for that wave of emotion that they're going to have on the other end or additional questions that they may have. Well, the real power here is to have a plan ahead of time. You cannot plan for everything. You cannot plan for most emergencies, but at least having something written down that you can refer back to and maybe the the client as well, if it's in your policies of during an, an emergency, this is how I'm going to communicate, is going to set you up for success. Stress and emergencies are made worse when we don't have a plan, when we don't have the right gear or equipment or training. So it's important to stay up on that pet first aid and CPR by taking it as frequently as you can and having good supplies in your car as well. That pet first aid kit in your car is going to help save you. Keep your phone charged. Have a battery pack wick because when your phone dies, when you've taken hundreds of (laughs) pictures of pets every day and you use your phone constantly, have that battery pack saved. And while we talk about the dangers of being on autopilot for normal visits, for your normal dog walks, for your routines, in stressful and emergency situations, going on autopilot to some extent can actually be very helpful because your brain is going haywire. There's a lot of things going on. So you need to read. That's why you need to rehearse and practice your skills for CPR. Practice these things that you have in place so that you don't have to think about, is it 20 compressions? Was it 13? Where's my card? How do I do this? What do I do? And this goes down to rehearsing your communication strategies. Practice the situation with a friend. Sit and see what 15 minute intervals actually feels like. Practice phrases over the phone with someone listening so that you're emotionally ready to have to say the phrase of something like, I'm sorry, Baxter didn't make it. Practice driving to the emergency vet. You don't want the first time that you need it to be the first time you're looking it up on the map, right? Or know what traffic flow is. Is it the second left or is that the one-way entrance that they have? Do you have to go around back? Where is their door? How do you get in? It's also really easy just to type the wrong thing when you're shaking and you're rushing and you miss the six and it was supposed to be a three or whatever it is. Practice these skills, some of these skills, to the extent that you can go on autopilot in those extreme situations when you're stressed. Yes, there's other things that we have to account for where we don't want to be so on autopilot that we miss the vomit on the floor or we miss the other thing that might catch fire or we miss these other things in these stressful situations. But the skills that you have need to be honed to the extent that you can perform them under duress and under optimal situations. Because that's the thing. When you take a CPR class, you're doing it. You're well fed. You've had your coffee. It's nice outside. You're, you know, you've got a little bit of time on your hands and you're just kind of going through the motions. When you need those skills is when everything is blowing up and things are hitting the fan. And it's not, you can't train in one situation and expect to perform optimally in a different situation. So have those practiced well and understand your own capacities and limitations in them as well. Yeah, because the time for freaking out is not when you're in the situation, it's after. You know, Arden Moore has that saying, I give you permission to freak out later. <laughs> you know, have the two to three friends that you can talk to about this. 
maybe even have the phone number of a counselor already in your phone. Prepare for the quiet after the stress. It's the most uncomfortable thing to sit with your feelings, to, to potentially have the, the regrets that, oh, I could have done something different. I could have saved the dog or cat, or I could have prevented the fight from happening, or I could have locked the door in extra time. Or, you know, your, bo- your body is riding high on endorphins. Your blood is pumping, and it feels like you just ran a marathon, and then suddenly it all goes away. So what are you going to do when the quiet happens? How are you going to process those feelings and sit with with them, but not sulk because we don't want to be doing that either. We want to acknowledge the feelings, say their name, say, yes, I have these feelings of sadness or remorse or whatever it is, and then move on from those once you have processed them. And this goes, the, the planning, the planning continues, right? Do you have a backup who can take over for a few days while you recover? Do you have a contingency plan if you have a ma- major event, a major emergency happen? Not just most of us think, oh, I need a plan for emergency where I get a flat tire or my house burns down or I'm sick or I can't. Are you going to be able to go through an extremely stressful situation, an extreme emergency, and then show up the next day, continuing with visits, ready to go in the same condition and in aptitude as before? Most likely not. Now, some people may use that as an opportunity to continue to the healing process of investing themselves back and working their way through the emotions without actually addressing them. But what is going to be best for you? Only you know that, but have those plans in place because planning isn't just for the moment of the stress, of the emergency, of that extreme situation. It's also for the countless moments afterwards that you have to be ready for. We would love to know how you handle stressful situations. I'm sure it's different than what we've described here, but how does it work for you and your business? You can let us know at feedback at petsitterconfessional.com. Thank you for listening to this today. And also thank you to Pet Sitters Associates and our Patreon members for supporting today's show. And we will talk with you next time. Bye. (laughs) 